Hello again, and thank you for watching uh, probably this last video in Module 12. We're here, we're looking at uh, putting together a goodness of fit test to determine whether or not we have evidence to show that a uh, population is not normally distributed. So here we're looking at a local painting company that employs students to do some analysis uh, on the completion times of its employees. One part of the analysis is to determine the completion times are normally distributed or typo or not not normally distributed. Oh, there we go. The data below consists of the number of minutes it took each of 30 employees to finish painting a bedroom. The average completion time is 73.93 minutes, standard deviation 15.41, and here our data has been sorted from uh, smallest to largest. Uh, again, just for convenience, because it makes things... Uh, we have to do it anyway, so it might as well be done ahead of time to save us a bit of time here. So, okay, step one. Formulate the null and alternative hypotheses. Again, at this point, we must be experts at doing this. Uh, distribution, or let's just say uh, population, I'm going to use abbreviations, is normally distributed uh, mu 15, no, mu is 7393, sigma is 1541, HO pop is not normally distributed, da da da, mu 7393, oh my gosh, what's happening with my writing here? 7393, sigma 1541. Okay, <sighs> long winded. So, null hypothesis is that it is normally distributed with these uh, parameters. Alternative is that it is not normally distributed with those same parameters. Okay, so there we've got our null and our alternative setup. Now, the next part of this uh, is actually kind of the long, tedious part of these problems. Compute the actual and expected frequency. So, we need to set this up so that we have a minimum uh, uh, expected frequency of 5. So, I've sort of designed this problem to make that a little bit easier to work with. Most practice problems you'll find will be set up to sort of facilitate some of these more mundane parts of the calculations. So 30 employees, I need to have uh, a minimum of five observations in each probability interval. So what I can do here is just split this up into six categories. If I take 30, divide it by six, I get five observations in each of those six categories. So here's five, five, and five, and we'll just split it like this. So now I've got my six different categories, each with five uh, observations in them. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit here. So now later when we go towards calculating our test statistic, our test statistic is that chi-squared value, i is n, y through n, and we're going to be looking at those differences between expected values and actual, so expected frequencies and actual frequencies squared divided by the expected. I'm going to put brackets around that because that denominator is also included in that summation. So here we'll go through and we'll calculate, well, what are our expected frequencies? Well, because of how I've set this up, this is always going to be 5, 5. I have six categories, each with five uh, observations in each. So that part's easy. Now what we need to do, and this part's a little bit more tedious, is figure out what are those actual frequencies. And in order to do that, well, now we come back to this assumption that the null hypothesis is true unless we have evidence to show otherwise. So what does that mean if the null hypothesis is true? Well, it means that we have a distribution that looks something like this with a mean of 73.93. And now we're dividing this into six categories. So one, two, there's three, four, five, and six. So I'm referring to these areas here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now we need to calculate what are the width of those uh, probability intervals. 
in order to do that, well, we need to know what is the probability uh, in each of those intervals. So what's the area under the curve? So if we know the area under that distribution is equal to 1, so if I just scribble over here 1, we're splitting that up into 6 different intervals. So this gives us a value of 0.1667. So each of these intervals, the area under the curve in each of these intervals is equal to 1667, 1667, 1667, and so on all the way over to the other side. Now we need that information because now we have to calculate what are the corresponding values that define each of these probability intervals. I've got the mean at 73.93 and here we have a standard deviation as given to us 1541. So we can use all of this information now to figure out what those values are going to be. So this one at the very far left. This is going to be 73.93 minus some critical value that corresponds with that probability of 0.1667 times our standard deviation 15.41. So we need to go to our z tables to look up what that critical value is going to be. So our probability of interest is 0.1667. If we come to our tables, the closest we'll find, I guess, is going to be here, 0.166. So that gives us a critical value of 0.97. So if I use that value in this calculation, 0 0.97, and here I'll grab my calculator. So this is 73.93 minus 0.97 times 15.41. So that gives me a value of 58.98. So there we have, let me just clear this up, let's mix up our color here. 58.98, let me just verify, sometimes I make silly mistakes. Okay, 58.98, good. Now let's do the next one. The next one is gonna be a very similar calculation. So here looking at this one. 73.93 minus some critical value that we'll look up times that standard deviation 1541. So that critical value, that has to correspond to an area of 1.667 plus 1.667. So it's this area plus this area. So that's going to be, well, let's just see, 1.1667 times 2. So 3334, three, three, uh, let's go to our tables here, 0.3334, three, three, here we are, probably around this one here will be our 3334 three, three, little round. So then I'll have a value of negative 4,3 is that critical value, so 0.43, we put that into our calculation. And now that gives us 73.93 minus 0.43 times 15.41, 67.3. Oops, where am I? 67.3, there we go, 67.3. Good, okay, we're making some progress here. 67, okay, so next one, let's carry on. So now these two, these are gonna be very similar calculations that now we're gonna be adding. So those critical values are gonna be the same because the distribution is symmetric. So the critical value that corresponds to 0.167 uh, in the lower tail will be the same in absolute value as that which corresponds to the e same probability in the upper tail. So this one will be 73.93 plus, so instead of this minus, it's a plus, 0.97 times 15.41. So here we have 73.93 plus 0.97 times 15.41, 88.88. Uh, .88. So here we go, there it is, oh, what's going on? 
it's supposed to be my eraser, but sometimes it doesn't change to my eraser. So 88.88, and now this last one, this one here, do I have room 73.93 plus, and again it's going to be the same as this, but it'll be a plus value, plus 0.43. 1541. And here we go. 7393 plus 0 0.43. Oops, what happened there? 7393 plus. Ah, what's going on? Again, 7393 plus 0 0.43 times 1541 equals 80.56. There we go, 80.56. So, all of that, now just to define those size of those probability intervals. Now what we need to do is determine how many actual observations do we have within each of those intervals. So this first one is going to be how many observations are less than or equal to 58.98. So if we go through here, I have 58.9, so that'll be equal to five. So I have five observations there. Between 58 and 67.3, that's going to be, that'll include this one. So let's go like this. The next one between 67.3 and 73. Oh, how many did I have there? One, two, three, four, five, six in that one. The next one, 67.3 to 73.9, so up to 73, so that'll be just these ones here, so one, two, three, four, five, okay, and, and then between 73.9 and 80 and a half, so that's going to be these ones here, one, two, three, four, five. And the next one will be between 80 and 88. So that'll be just these ones here. One, two, three, four. And so the last one will be the rest. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. There. So all of these calculations here were just so that we could figure out what those observed frequencies are. Okay. Let me clear up some space here just so that we can finish off these calculations. So now what we need to do, we need to calculate these differences between the expected values and our observed values. I'm just going to scroll this up a little bit. Then we need to take those values and square them and divide them by that expected uh, frequency. So this first one should be relatively straightforward. Zero, um, minus one, zero, zero, uh, one, and zero. My goodness, this is a, we can probably jump to our conclusion right away just looking at these values. Then we square them, divide them by the corresponding uh, expected value, which is five the whole way down. So this is zero, one fifth, zero, zero, one fifth, and zero. Finally, so here we've got all of this stuff. I should say we've got all of these. So now we just need to add those together. So I can just do this one in my head. Here we have two fifths. Let's just get that into a decimal form actually because that'll make it easier to look up on the table. So it's 0.4 and that is our chi-squared value. So there's our test statistic. Now, we just need to look up, uh, figure out what are our degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom, this one's a little bit strange. This is k minus p minus 1, where k is the number of categories. And all of that means is how many different groups, how many different categories have we divided that normal distribution in. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, six categories. So K is six. P is the number of estimated parameters. And then here we go back up to the problem. 
we have, uh, we're estimating the mean and the standard deviation. So here we have the mean and the standard deviation. And so coming back down, this means I have P is equal to two. So six minus two minus one, three degrees of freedom. Test statistic is uh, 0.4. So now we can go to our chi-squared tables, three degrees of freedom. And where do we find the value of 0.4? It's somewhere in between here. So our p-value is enormous. <laughs> our p-value is something greater than 0.9, between 0.9 and 0.95. So for any reasonable level of significance, I, again, I forgot to, uh, to state it, my bad. We do this at alpha 0.04, we could do this at alpha 0.01. Any reasonable level of significance. Uh, here we have a p-value, according to that chi-squared statistic, that is greater than 0 0.9. So with a p-value that large, we are certainly unable to reject this uh, null hypothesis. We have absolutely no evidence here to support that alternative hypothesis. So we're unable to say that it is not normally distributed. Okay, so that's it. We've got, uh, we did all of our calculations for our frequencies. We just used the p-value approach to draw our conclusion. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, here it means that these completion times uh, of these painters painting the bedrooms, for all intents and purposes, we're unable to say they're not normally distributed. So let's go ahead and say it looks like it's normally distributed. The evidence supports the null hypothesis uh, quite strongly. Okay, so that's it. As simple as that. <laughs> Some of these calculations I know are a little bit tedious. Probably these ones here are the... the most tedious part. I wouldn't say they're not challenging. It's just lots of room for little mistakes when you're looking up all these values on the tables and doing these little calculations. But once that's done, once that's done, I think it goes fairly smoothly. So I hope that that was helpful. Thanks again for watching. Bye bye.